Hey there, everyone. Welcome to OnCon. I hope you're having a fantastic OnCon so far. I'm sure that I am. Um, my name is Kira Fox, and I will be doing the panel Japan Travel for Otaku. Um, so a little bit about me before we really jump into the panel. Um, I've been a resident of Japan for about four years and moved to Japan. I'm actually in Japan right now recording this video. Um, I've lived here for over four years now. And I've worked as an English teacher at Japanese schools, Japanese middle schools, elementary schools. I've been a private tutor. I've been a graphic designer. So I've done a few different things in Japan. I'm currently located in Ibaraki Prefecture. I used to live in Miyagi Prefecture. It's just north of Tokyo. That's all you need to know. Um, and first went to Japan in 2014. Now, obviously, a big part of why I do like Japan and like Japanese culture, and probably like many of you, um, is because... Maybe you got into anime at a young age, and through anime, you discovered more about Japan. And hey, there's no shame in that at all. Um, I think it's a really cool way to get into Japanese culture and Japanese language. So no shame there at all. So the contents of this panel are going to be talking about the things that you can do when you come to Japan. Um, if you're an, an otaku, things you can enjoy and enjoy as an otaku. Um, now, I know that as of the recording of this video, we don't know when Japan is going to open. Um, if you're not aware, Japan has been closed to foreign tourists, foreign visas for over two years now. And hopefully they open border soon and you guys can come and enjoy all the fun things that Japan has to offer, but I'm hoping that sometimes this year, sometime this year that they do open, and so when that happens, you'll have all the knowledge you need for doing otaku. Whoops! I just spilled water all over me. Do you like my mug? This is my um, introverted but willing to discuss anime mug, and I got it from OnCon. Actually, I got it at the uh, charity auction last OnCon, so stick around for that. I'm gonna drink a little bit of water so my throat's not so dry. Anyway, yeah, stick around for the charity auction after. I have water on me, but it's fine. We gotta keep it rolling. So we're gonna be talking about the shopping that you can do, where you can pick up anime figures, um, keychains. I'll tell you some of my favorite shops, um, manga, if you're interested in picking up some Japanese manga and stuff, just, you know, we're nerds. We like to buy things. Uh, when you come to Japan, bring an extra suitcase because you will be buying a lot of things. <laughs> um, we'll be talking about the events that happen in Japan, such as Kamaket, which is short for Comic Market, which is this event that has been going on for decades now. We'll get into that. Um, pop-up events or pop-up shops for different, uh, series. We'll talk about those too. Anime tourism, which if you were at a previous OnCon, you've seen me talk about anime tourism quite a bit, where you'll have these uh, towns that actually use anime, use anime series to advertise their town and bring people in for sightseeing. We'll talk a little bit about that. Not too much because I've done a whole panel on that before at OnCon. We're going to talk about movie screenings. Um, you know, it doesn't sound like it's that exciting to go to an anime movie in Japan, but there's always extra little incentives that are make it worth going out to the movie theater to see the anime movie. Now, I know that, I'll get into this, but I know that in America, or last time, when I did live in America four years ago, it was less common that anime movies got screen time um, in in America. Back in my day, it was like, okay, you got like the Full Metal Alchemist movie and the Sorted Online movies, like the really popular stuff. But now it seems like America's finally airing smaller, le lesser known anime movies, um, which is fantastic. Um, and then we'll be talking about museums, anime museums. This is actually a picture of me at the Osama Tezuka Museum in Kobe. So what kind of museums can you enjoy as an otaku or, or fan of manga and anime in Japan? There's a lot. So yeah, let's get into it. This is Japan. So actually, I ran this panel at a different convention, so I just wanted to, you know, get make sure that make sure that people kind of knew 
a little bit about the geography of Japan because some people will fly, hopefully, hopefully you can see my mouse here, some people will fly into Tokyo. Um, I would say most people will fly into Tokyo when they come to Japan. And so we want to talk about stuff that you can do around the Tokyo area. So especially if it's your first time in Japan, you're going to be a little bit overwhelmed. You probably don't want to uh, plan too many things that are too far away from your hotel or you know you don't want to have to book extra hotels or flights or trains that can become overwhelming so i'll mostly be talking about a lot of stuff that is within tokyo for you to you to enjoy but recently um it's actually been said that down here hopefully you can see my mouse in the purple osaka has recently um well before the pandemic <laughs> has taken over Tokyo as one of the most touristy, international touristy places in Japan. A lot of people tend to go to Osaka a lot nowadays, so we'll also talk about um, kind of anime things you can do around Osaka. So these are the two main areas, which nine times out of ten I feel like people are going to fly into either Tokyo or Osaka. Um, of course, there's many different things all over, the, all over Japan that you can do that relate to otaku hobbies, but we'll mostly be talking about these two areas. So I want to get into shopping for otaku goods. This is one of my personal favorite things about being in Japan, about visiting Japan, um, is the shopping. And so there are two, you can, you can buy anime goods all over Japan, but I would say that there are two places that stick out the most. And that would be Aki the Akihabara district in Tokyo and then Denden Town in Osaka. Now, a lot of you guys have probably already heard about Akihabara. If you've been to Japan and you're an anime fan, you've probably been to Akihabara. Um, it tends to be first on a lot of people's list and it, it was first on my list actually when I first moved to Japan. Actually, when I first moved to Japan, you know, I got through customs, got through check-in um to my hotel and stuff and then the like I woke up at 5 a.m and immediately got on a train <laughs> from the Narita area the Narita airport area to Akihabara so I did not um I just wanted to go straight there I did not hesitate so we'll be talking about what you can find in Akihabara what you can talk find in Denden Town which Denden Town is the anime town of Osaka it's the Akihabara of Osaka and Akihabara is just the anime town of Tokyo so we'll talk a little bit about these. Um, so what is Akihabara? So Akihabara was used to be, like back in the 70s and early 80s, was primarily the place you would go to to pick up electronics, um, new electronics, used electronics, cameras, uh, just at the time, like in the 80s, especially because in the 70s and 80s, the Japanese economy was just blowing up. Um, and they were making, at the time, VHS players and uh, TVs and all these electronics. So Japan, uh, most likely you have Japanese electronics in your house, um, especially probably back in the 80s. Um, so as, this is where you would, Akihabara, you would go there. That's why it's called, sometimes it's called Electric Town is because that's where you would go to get tech and electronics is Akihabara. And eventually that warped into the anime town that you might know it as today. And so now Akihabara is just known for having stores that hold otaku goods. It's the best place you can go to, I think, or one of the best places you can go to, I think, if you're uh, a figure guy and you want to buy enemy figures. Um, they're just stuff for keychains, buttons, all like anything anime that you want, you could, you're gonna want to go to Akihabara and you can find it. Um, and then there's also just so many arcades. You see the Sega arcade right now, right here in this picture. Um, unfortunately, well, I wouldn't say unfortunately, but it might be unfortunate for some people. Uh, the company Gigo bought all of the, all of the Sega arcades and leased in Akihabara. So they're not known as Sega anymore. They're known as Gigo. Um, the arcades are always really fun, but I think people re were really attached to Sega as a name for these arcades. I know I was, my first video game console ever was a Sega Genesis, so Sega as just a brand name is very nostalgic to me, um, and it is iconic to me, so to see Gigo buy out the Sega buildings was a little bit sad, but basically the insides of these arcades are all the same. You've got your rhythm games, you've got the crane games where you can win whole anime figures and really high quality plushies and stuff. Um, 
and other kinds of anime games like um, the fake, there's a fake grand order game, there's Sword Online games, there's uh, Konkole and stuff like that. So uh, if you're interested in any of these Japanese arcade games that you normally don't find in America, I know that recently um, Round One has a couple of locations in America now, and they've done really good at bringing uh, Japanese style arcade machines to America so that Americans can play them. Um, but I, I would say that that's definitely a recent thing. The only time that I was able to play Japanese arcade games was if I was at a convention because, uh, uh, Tokyo, what are they called? Um, the, oh man, I can't remember Tokyo Arcade. There, there's a, there's a company out there that will bring it to conventions, uh, Japanese arcade machines. And so anyway, places like Magfest and Otakon were really the only places that me and a lot of my friends could play Japanese arcade games. So uh, Tokyo Attack. Tokyo Attack. That's what it is, by the way. Um, so yeah, companies like Tokyo Attack will bring to conventions these Japanese arcade machines. And but in, in Japan, you can just like go and play them at the arcades there. And it feels like half the time there's an arcade on every single block. I mean, there is an arcade, literally multiple arcades on every, oh, in every single block in Akihabara, in the Akihabara district. So if you want to get your fill on Japanese rhythm games or crane games or whatever, you'll definitely want to spend some time at the arcades. I would say arcade, uh, Akihabara is probably most famous for idols, uh, idol shows being there, even though recently idol shows, a lot of them have moved to Shibuya. Idol shows, uh, maid cafes, arcades, um, and the anime shopping would probably be the biggest things there. Um, and we'll get into these a little bit more individually. So yeah, things to do in Akihabara. Um, so maid cafes, as I mentioned before, huge thing in Akihabara. There are, I want to say the two biggest known brands or like branches of maid cafes in Akihabara are at home maid cafe and maid dreamin'. So you, when you come to Akihabara, you'll definitely see uh, maids in the streets trying to get you to come to their maid cafe and try their maid cafe. And uh, it, it, it's really cool because I don't think like anywhere, nowhere else, like especially in America, maybe in LA, will you see, you know, cute Japanese maids all dressed up in their maid gear, trying to get you to come into their maid cafe. I think LA actually recently started to have uh, some, some like maid cafes because Japanese culture is becoming so big and it's a little bit easier to access this now but um before then seeing maids in the street just getting trying to get you to come into the maid cafe was just so foreign to me and so crazy um but yeah you'll see maids probably on every block trying to get you to come into their um, maid cafe i've never been to maid dreamin but maid dreamin maids they're all over the place like they're definitely trying to get you to come <laughs> into <laughs> their maid cafe and then at home maid cafe is one that i've frequented um I actually recommend at home a lot. It feels, you'll, you'll kind of understand what I mean. Made Dreamin, you know, at the end of the day, this is a business. It is in a way a corporation. And so the maids have to make money. The business has to make money. And so it can sometimes feel like that with Made Dreamin, with at home Maid Cafe. It's actually at home with like at symbol and then home. It felt a little more personable. It didn't really feel like they were trying to make some cash. Um, so yeah, do be mindful of that if you decide to do the maid cafes. Now, a really big rule about the maids, um, in Akihabara on the streets, do not photograph them. I mean, much less without their permission, but, um, the thing about maid cafes, one of the gimmicks about a maid cafe is that you actually pay for what is called a checky, and it's usually a, you know, those Polaroid cameras, and it just, like, instantly prints out, uh, pictures. They're, they're, like, totally coming back into style the last couple years, um, you pay to have either a two-shot checky, which is you and the maid together, or like a one-shot checky of the maid, which is just a picture of the maid. And they'll print it out and they'll draw, they'll sign it in Japanese and they'll draw it on it. They'll do all this cute stuff. And those are usually about like 2,000 yen, so about 20 US dollars, 17 to 20 US dollars. So they actually make a lot of their money off of photographs of themselves. So you can't just like whip out your smartphone and start taking pictures of the maids. Uh, so yeah, be very, very careful about that. Not only inside of the maid cafe, but also outside of the maid cafe. Uh, be very careful of that. But that is one of the big things you can do in Akihabara. And, and they'll they'll make you amu rice as well. And you've seen it in anime where they'll take ketchup and they'll draw like words and stuff and draw little bears and cats and whatever you want <laughs> on the omurai. So you can do stuff like that. You can get uh, pretty delicious 
uh, parfaits and desserts. It can get a little expensive, but I do think that it is something definitely worth doing. Um, at, at, at home, where I went to, they actually will uh, occasionally do a dance on stage, like a cute little kawaii-style <laughs> dance. And it's very fun. So I definitely recommend doing the maid cafes. Um, in Akihabara, there's also ones in Denden Town if you decide to go to um, Osaka. I would say that there is a, there are maid cafes in just about every major city in Japan um, under the maid dreaming um, title. So you'll be, you'll be able to find one, but especially if you're in Tokyo and Akihabara, there's probably, I, can't, I couldn't give you a number, but there's definitely a maid cafe on every street. And so also in Akihabara, obviously you, want, you can do your shopping. You do your anime figure shopping, which anime figures definitely more affordable if you buy them in Japan versus buying them at a convention, especially the prize figures. Um, the prize figures are usually figures that you can uh, win at an arcade. And so, you know, you pop a couple of bucks in there, you win your, your anime figure. Um, a lot of people sell these anime figures to secondhand shops, and then these secondhand shops will sell them for about 30 to 40, uh, 3,000 to 4,000 yen, so about 30 to 40 US dollars. Um, but then what happens at conventions is that they will buy these price figures because they're the cheaper figures and then sell them for double, triple the price at an anime convention. Um, for example, I have an Asuka figure. I don't even think it's a price figure, but I have an Asuka figure that I bought at a convention in 2014. I paid $40 for it. I have literally found it in Akihabara for like less than 10 US dollars. <laughs> So that's kind of the idea is that you will be able to do so much uh, shopping for so much cheaper when it comes to, and not only anime figures, but um, acrylic stands, wrist straps, whatever kind of anime things you collect, you'll definitely be able to find them cheaper in Japan by quite a bit. I think you'll be very surprised. I knew that things would be cheaper when I got to Japan, but it's just like the reality set in. I'm like, oh my gosh, like this $120 figure is only $50 here in Japan. It's crazy. Um, you'll definitely want to take part in eating in Akihabara. Akihabara has everything. They have McDonald's, they have KFC, they have gyudon, uh, which is beef bowl. They have it all. Um, but this picture actually up here, um, this is uh, gyudon. I don't know those other kanji. Uh, is that? Uh, anyway, gyudon sampo. Sampo is the um, blue letters right there. So this uh, this is actually significant because you might think that this is familiar to you if you have seen or played Steins Gate. This is the Gyudon place that the characters always like to go to, um, the very one. So yeah, th this is uh, I'll get into later because Steins Gate takes place in Akihabara and you can do like the anime pilgrimage for Steins Gate stuff. But yeah, this is the Gyudon place in which Steins Gate takes place. So there's just all kinds of fun little hole-in-the-wall places to eat. Um, try something new every day. If, if you spend a week in Akihabara, trust me, it's easy to do. Um, try try a new place every day. They have all kinds all kinds of different things in Akihabara. Um, also, um, speaking of places to eat, they'll have anime-themed cafes. Anime Cafe is a popular, uh, popularly known one. Known one. Uh, you can see in the picture right here, they're doing a Love Life Sunshine Aqua Cafe. Um, in Akihabara, I've done anime cafes for Kaguya-sama Loves War. Um, I almost did a, they had a Cowboy Bebop one, but that one was so popular that you had to get reservations. So keep in mind that if you want to do some of these anime cafes, uh, look online. There's a website, um, if you type in Collab Cafe JP, like Japan, it's a Japanese website that you could translate into English. It will let you know all of the collaboration cafes going on in Japan and you can narrow it down to just in Akihabara. So when you're, if you come to Japan, go to that website, go to um, just the Akihabara tab and it'll be like, oh, they're doing a Spy Family Cafe at Anime Today. You can go there and do that. Uh, so I recommend the anime cafes. The food, not always the best thing. Don't expect the food to be great. Expect it to be a novelty. Um, you go there for the experience. You don't really go there because the food is good. But those are just a few of the things that you can do in Akihabara. So my personal Akihabara favorites um, are the Surugaya Specialty Store. This is a figure shop. Um, and, and feel free to write this down, type this down in your phone, whatever, how if you feel the need to, if you want to remember, take a screenshot of the video uh, so you can remember. 
but these are just some of my recommendations. If you're if you're completely lost, some people they arrive in Akihabara, they're completely lost, they don't know where to go. Um, so these are just my recommendations. Sirkai Specialty uh, Figure Store is one of my favorite figure shops in town. I think that they have a lot of older things. They don't try to like just stock all Dragon Dragon Ball Z figures and uh, Kimetsu no Yaiba figures and and Sword Art Online figures. Let me tell you something about Akihabara. And the people that own the figure stores, they know what foreigners like. They know what people from overseas like. Um, at a lot of stores, you will see the very front just be stocked with One Piece, Naruto, Kimetsu no Yaiba, Dr Dragon Ball Z is a big one, and Pokemon. Because they know <laughs> that foreigners will come and buy up that stuff. Um, but Sir Guy Special Shop, I never really felt like pushed that that much. Like you can find a lot more obscure anime figures there, and a lot of old ones that I've found have been there. So if, if ever you're in Akihabara, you can just type in Sir Gaia. Um, they have card shops too and DVD shops, so you have to make sure that it's a specifically a figure shop. What I mean by that, Sir Gaia probably has like four or five locations in Akihabara, and two of them are figure stores. So just be mindful of that. Make sure um, to look through the pictures, making sure that you are going to the figure shop if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, I highly recommend. And the prices, I think, are some of the best in town. And then the, my second recommendation um, for an anime shop, mostly figures, <laughs> is Liberty Anime Shop. Liberty Anime Shop has also several locations in Akihabara. It's kind of similar to Surigaya, but I think they do have a lot more of um, the mainstream stuff if that's what you're looking for. The prices definitely aren't bad. I think Surigaya's prices are better, but Liberty Anime Shop, uh, if you find one on the Akihabara Strip, 100% um, you, should stop, you should stop there. Um, Ami Ami Anime. Now, you might know Ami Ami for um, being like a really popular place to reserve uh pre-order new anime figures. I should say that Surugaya and Liberty they are more secondhand shops. They don't do a lot of new stuff. Which is why they're so cheap because you're buying things secondhand. And buying things secondhand, totally recommend it in Japan. People tend to take really good care of their items, so I don't think you'll really have any problems. And a lot of these places also will write on the box and be very specific to you if the product has damage. So don't worry about that. Um but Ami Ami you probably know for, you know, you can pre-order um, brand new figures in the, on there. They always announce new figures. Uh, Ami Ami Anime is also a place I recommend you go to if you're looking for something that just came out. Um, Star Kebab is, uh, this is just my favorite place to go eat at um, when I'm in Akihabara. It, it, it isn't Japanese food. It's actually um, Turkish kebabs, um, but they're, they're like kind of like shawarma. It's shawarma, right? So, uh, you can get it, you can get like a whole shawarma kebab sandwich for five bucks. You walk in, walk in. it's just a really nice outdoorsy atmosphere to it too. Kind of hole in the wall atmosphere as you can see in the picture. So just a little bit of ideas if you're completely lost on where to eat, um, where to shop in Akihabara, hit these, hit these places up first. Continuing on with shopping for otaku goods and some places that I really like. Book Off, as you see in the picture here, is another really popular place to see all over Japan. This place um, obviously has books, um, but in Akihabara, it's a wonderful place for if you're interested in buying manga. Um, because a lot of the manga here, they have entire shelves full of used manga that is only 110 yen or about one US dollar. Yeah, you can get used manga and fairly new series. We're not talking about series that were like forever ago. I'm talking like, you know, you want to buy the first uh, manga of Nonon Biori, they'll have it there for a dollar. Like something that's not that old. So now it will be in Japanese. They sometimes will have English manga, but because it's imported, the price is actually way more expensive than you could be. So I don't recommend buying English manga at, in Japan. I know that like kind of sounds obvious, but they do import English manga. So if like a Viz Media manga is like eleven ninety nine in America, it'll probably be like sixteen ninety nine or the uh, whatever that is in yen. So just be careful of that. So, but hey, uh, some people really do like to buy the Japanese manga and it looks really nice on a shelf too. It's so cheap. It's so cheap. I think you can sometimes buy, like if a series has 40 volumes, sometimes you can buy the whole set for, I'm not kidding you, like less than $40, like less than a dollar for each manga. So go to book off for stuff like that. If you're, I want to buy the whole series of blah, blah, blah. You've got to go to book off for that. Um, they're also known as like hobby offs and hard offs. Hard offs and hobby offs have 
uh, other things like furniture and home stuff. Um, book off is mostly just books, so keep that in mind. Uh, Second Street, that's another um, secondhand shop that you can go to. That ha I think their figures at Second Street are really cheap. I don't think their selection is good, but the figures are cheap. Lash and Bone, oh my gosh, probably, other than Surigaya, this is probably my second favorite place to buy figures. Um, the th reason why I like Lash and Bone so much is because... Uh, this store is organized so well. Most of them are. So it's like you're looking for a keychain from a very, very specific series. Um, they usually have like every series that you can think of will be uh, labeled on the shelf uh, so that you're not digging through a thousand different little keychains and buttons to find this one character from this one show that you want. They do a really good job of organizing their stuff. So Lash and Bang, write that down, write that down. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, Animate, which you've probably heard of. Animate kind of specializes more in stuff that is currently airing. And they get a bunch of new products. I want to say, if this is correct, like directly from the studios that make the show. So, um, for example, like last season, the big shows were um, Dress Up Darling. Uh, and for me, um, uh, Slow Loop and stuff like that. So to get the brand new stuff that might not show up yet at the second hand stores, you'll definitely want to go to animate. Um, like I'm trying to think of something that's airing right now. Spy Family. Spy Family is a great, animate has all the Spy Family stuff um, currently right now. So anything that's new uh, airing right now, you'll want to go to animate to pick it up. All right, so let's move on to conventions in Japan. Conventions in Japan are very, very different than conventions in America. You don't normally, if ever, show up to a convention in Japan already in cosplay. And now look in this picture. Look in this picture. People are dressed fairly normally too. You know, you kind of show up at anime cons in America and everyone's like dressed for a rave or they've got their Nekomimi on or they're in cosplay or in a, you know, maybe just a Luffy hat or something like that. They're sporting what they like. That was not really the case when I went to Comic Cat and Anime Japan, which is an anime um, specific event in Japan. People dress like they're just like going out for Sunday brunch, <laughs> regular clothes. So that's something that's quite different um, about Japan. I'm not exactly quite sure why it is that way. Um, but for cosplay, you basically show up to the convention in regular clothes, usually regular makeup, not in your wig, and you bring a suitcase that has your cosplay stuff in it. You actually pay a fee to use the changing rooms and to grab a spot where you stand in cosplay and photographers come and take pictures of you. It's generally not this idea where you get dressed and then you walk around the convention. There are places at the convention that are off limits for cosplay and then um, places that are uh, specifically set aside where cosplayers are supposed to be. So keep that in mind, uh, there are people who show up to the convention in cosplay, but it's almost always foreigners every single time. Uh, so just, you know, keep that in mind. Um, here's Tokyo Big Site, where a lot, that's me at Tokyo Big Site, where a lot of these events take place. So Comic Cat being one, um, which is the biggest comic market probably in the world, not just Japan, where um, artists will come and sell their own manga um, and then... Also, in, there's industry at Comic Cat that will be um, advertising games and anime. You can actually see this is not, it's not Tokyo Big Site Station. There's another station that I can't remember the name of. It's near Tokyo Big Site. Um, you can see where they're uh, advertising the Nonon Biori movie at this station and then Steins Gate Zero back when those were um, being, uh, had gotten announced in 2018. So industries will be there too, but um, Comic Cat, I would say, is bigger for the individual artist than it is for um industry level stuff anime japan is another event that is it's it, there's not individual uh like artists there it's just more industry announcements um but comic cat does have like a balance of these two things so uh tokyo comic cat this is what um well, i'll go into a little bit more detail so you can kind of see these lines leading up to um tokyo Tokyo Big Site, you've probably seen it in anime before if you've seen stuff like Comic Party or uh, Oremo is another good example or Watakoi. 
uh, you've definitely seen this building before if you've seen any of those anime. Um, but the lines can just be ridiculous. There are two Kamikaze a year, well, before the pandemic. Um, one in August and one in, during New Year's time. And the August one, I, I've, bought, I've, been, I've gone to both of them. I cannot actually recommend you go to the summer one because it is so dang hot in Tokyo. We're talking like 100 degree weather, 100% humidity. And do you want to be standing with all of those people out in the sun uh, waiting for potentially hours to get into the building. People will start lining up as early, I want to say it's like 5 or 6 a.m. so that they can get st um, some some specific artwork and doujin. They sell out really quickly, like immediately. And so that's why people come so early and wait in line. Um, I waited in line in the rain for Winter Comic Cat. It may have been summer. No, it was definitely Winter Comic Cat. For Winter Comic Cat, uh, I think I was in line for an hour and a half. I could not imagine doing that out in the Tokyo August. If you've been to Tokyo in August, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not worth standing outside for an hour and a half. So just a fair warning. Now it is a once in a lifetime thing for some people. So it might be worth it to you. Don't let me tell you what's worth it for you. It's not worth it for me. It could 100% be worth it for you. You do your thing. Um, but this is um, this picture of this cosplayer is a really good example of kind of the, this gated off area of where she's standing. It's not the most uh, scenic uh, cosplay photo you could have that you know these cosplayers they will often go to their own studios or do an on location shoot shoot because you know this uh idol character it doesn't really it, it, it's not the best scenery you've got people walking in the background you got the 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 barrier set up behind her so <laughs> people just kind of go more to like advertise what they're capable of in cosplay you know japan is is a country that um, a lot of businesses do hire cosplayers for um for events and for advertising and stuff in fact um i have two friends that recently cosplayed as ray and asuka from evangelion um and stood outside of softbank which is a cell phone uh provider <laughs> to get people to come in so that's just kind of a thing that happens in japan so a lot of these um cosplayers just kind of want to you know be like oh this is what i'm capable of um and hopefully get more jobs or whatever, not not exactly to get the, the, the best pictures, but this is kind of like, you know, an idea. And and people will be lined up in a, in, a, in a straight line and the photographer will take a picture of the cosplayer and then the next one will climb. So it's a very organized, it's not kind of like at American conventions where you crowd, like there's like a crowd around one cosplayer. It's a very organized thing. You're a straight line. Uh, they'll be like cosplayer, 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 straight line, straight line, straight line. It's fairly organized. It's really cool to see, um, honestly, one of the most inter almost one of the most entertaining aspects of Tokyo Comic Cat. Um, and then there's also smaller Comic Cats in smaller cities. So Tokyo is obviously a city of eight, nine million people just in Tokyo Prefecture. Um, and then Sendai is a city up to the north with a population of like 1.9 million. So its Comic Cat is way smaller. Um, Tokyo Comic Cat can see. 500,000 people at the event over the course of the weekend. Um, Sunday Comic Cat, no, nowhere near those numbers. Very, uh, very small. Um, I'm looking at this picture of that Sonic and Knuckles doujin, and now I have regrets because I would have loved to buy something like that. I didn't even notice it. Um, but this picture is one that I took uh, from Sendai Comic Cat. Um, and then that is actually me cosplaying at Sendai Comic Cat. Same cosplay rules where you don't show up to the convention and cosplay. You bring it in a bag. Uh, you don't have your wig on or anything. And I bought, it was like a 500 yen ticket, about a $5 ticket. And then they take you um, to this uh, room, which I'm not even sure if it was separated guys and girls. I really have no idea. It was mostly female cosplayers. So I mostly saw females in there, but I didn't see another area that was like marked off for guys. But yeah, basically just everyone goes in there, um, starts stripping, like not down to like being naked, but uh, a lot of the girls will just wear like um, camis or tank tops or something to not be because if it is like mi if it's mixed guys and girls uh, you know you want to be a little bit decent so a lot of people wear um, like Spanx or like shorts and a tank top so that they like don't completely they're not like you know completely naked or whatever um, and then put their cosplay on over that 
Um, and so I did the same thing. I went back there and, and you have to get dressed yourself. I didn't have any friends with me. Uh, I, my husband came with me, but he wasn't back here with me. So like, you have to get into it all to all yourself. And like cosplayers knows, like usually you need friends to like help you zip stuff and get into stuff properly. And so that was really hard. And then you, like, if you have any extra crazy makeup you have to do, like I had to do pink eyebrows for zero two. Um, you don't want to show up to the event in pink eyebrows. So it's like, you have to um, bring like your own compact mirror. They don't, at Sunday Comic Cat, maybe it was a smaller event. They didn't have like vanities or whatever, but like you do your makeup like with one hand. It's really difficult and you have no sink or water. So if you need water for whatever reason, like for wig styling, like you are just out of luck. It was the weirdest experience in getting into cosplay without like an actual bathroom or changing room. Um, it was just like part of the convention center blocked off with barriers and it was just like a hundred people like, there was a person on this side of me and a person on this side of me, and we were, like, we were, like, on our knees getting into cosplay, getting our makeup on. It was, like, the weirdest, um, cosplay experience I've probably ever had, but it was still, um, really fun. I would definitely do it again. So, you know, there are smaller events and stuff. And so, Anime Japan, this is the one that I told you about. This one, so, Chemi Tokyo Comic Cat happens twice a year in August and, um, in, like, January near New Year's. Um, the small, small, if you're in a smaller city in Japan, you can usually look, um, up on Twitter or, um, even sometimes the city's websites and they'll tell you when their individual comic cat is. Uh, Sentai Comic Cat actually held their event once every season, so four times a year. Now, Anime Japan, this is more of, like, industry style, an industry event, um, where, like, Sunrise, um, and Pony Canyon and all these uh, publishers and uh, animation companies will come and advertise what's new. So these are some pictures I took at Anime Japan 2018. This is when they announced the new Code Gas Resurrection movie. So they were advertising that Anime Japan. There's cosplayers too, only in that one hall. The cosplayers could not walk around anywhere else, only in that one hall. Um, so if you're kind of, I, I personally like Anime Japan better. Um, not, I guess because I am really just that big of a fan of anime as an industry and I wanted to see what was new and coming up. Um, but I liked Anime Japan a lot better. There was less people. Um, it was during March, so it wasn't too hot. It's not too cold. Um, it's during March every year. So if you want to come in March 2023, uh, I totally recommend it. Um, and you get just so much free stuff. Um, like uh, headband, hat things, bags, um, stickers, buttons, like a bunch of cool free stuff, um, to, from, from the companies to try to get you to watch your shows. So I definitely recommend going to Anime Japan if you're ever, if you ever catch yourself in Tokyo. This is also at Tokyo Big Site, by the way, so the same place that Comic Cat is. So if you catch yourself in Japan or in Tokyo in March, totally hit up Anime Japan. Um, Comic Cat used to be free. I think they upped the prices though recently. Um, Anime Japan, I think I only paid like 2,000 yen for a day ticket, so like 20 bucks. It's not expensive. Um, another strange difference to me is that usually with places, you know, with um, Otakon and Katsukon or whatever, the, they'll have stuff going on until like midnight and sometimes past midnight, like panels and dances. It's not really like that with these conventions and events in Japan. Um, Comic Hat and Anime Japan both ended at 5 p.m. Um, and, and there's not really such thing as fan panels, right? Um, you'll have industry panels where they'll um, have the voice actors there. Um, and to get into these panels, you usually have to sign up via a lottery system online. So it's actually pretty hard to get a spot at one of these. It's not like a panel room with a hundred chairs. It's more of like panels that are at their individual booths and they might have like 30 seats. So at events where there's gonna be like 80,000 people there, not really a big chance you're gonna be seeing a panel um, at one of these events. So that is the thing I like better about Western anime events is, is the fan panels. Uh, I, I do miss that. So it feels more like a community too at Western conventions versus Japanese conventions as well. At Japanese conventions, it's like all business, right? Like it's all business, it's all making money, it's all advertising. Um, whereas Western anime conventions, it's a lot more like having fun, <laughs> I would say. Um, so let's get into a little bit about concerts. Um, this does have a lot to do with being an otaku. A lot of people, like this is uh, Lisa, who you might know um, does a lot of the music for Sorted Online, um, recently started doing a lot of the music for Kimatsu no Yaiba. Ah, taking a little sip. So you'll definitely want to probably catch, um, 
a concert in Japan, if you've heard, or maybe you just like Japanese music in general, but I feel like a lot of people, um, myself included, um, get into Japanese bands, especially before I came to Japan, get into Japanese bands because you hear them in an anime or something like that. Oh man, I love going to concerts in Japan, actually way more um, than in the West, I would say. Um, so here's just like a, a small concert venue. Um, a lot of bands do really small shows. Like I've been really surprised. Like um, I'm really into a Japanese band called NanoRipe. You've probably heard them. They do music for Food Wars. They do music for No No Biori. They did the opening for Citrus that aired um, several years ago. So I would say that they, they do a lot of pretty big shows. They've done a lot of really popular anime openings. Um, but I went to a venue way smaller than this even. <laughs> like a venue that maybe only held like 50 people when I went to go see them. Um, so like you kind of get a really good experience because there's not so many people <laughs> that go um, to these. Now there are groups like uh, I also saw Claris. Uh, one time, Claris, who you might know, who did the opening for the first season of Madoka Magica, um, they did the music in, um, Oremo. Um, I went to go see them, and that, that was at a much bigger venue, and Lisa, well, Lisa, she'll, you know, do, like, Tokyo Doom, Tokyo Doom, <laughs> Tokyo Dome, and these huge places, you know, she'll sell those out easily, so not every time, but, uh, oh, man, we gotta keep going, we gotta keep going, oh my gosh. Um, I don't want to run out of time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, I recommend, you know, go to go to a concert if you get the chance. Um, you can go on a website. It's called e-ticket. If you just go to Google and type in e-ticket Japan, uh, or I'm sorry, not e-ticket Japan, e-plus, e-plus, e-ticket might come up, but e-plus Japan, almost every single band that I've seen have used this website. Um, and you can go on it um, using American internet. You don't need a VPN or anything like that. Um, and you can just like click Tokyo, uh, go to the specific dates where you're gonna be in Japan and see what bands are playing. You'll probably be really surprised. Um, you might know like some of the bands that are playing. Um, there's all these shows and stuff going around uh, in Tokyo. So I definitely recommend it. Um, oh, also, if you're a woman, um, a lot of concerts have a women's, uh, women's only section on the floor. So like, uh, and by floor, I just mean like the, like general, like floor of the, uh, venue. Uh, so like when I went to go see Claris and when I get to go see several idols, I'd stand in the women's section. It's usually not so many people over there. It's not as crowded. Um, and it's usually put in a spot that has a really good view. Like for the idol concert, it was like right in the front. And then for, uh, Claris, it was like this lifted up place in the middle of the venue. And I had like a perfect view of Claris. So, um, if, if, uh, sorry guys, I'm sorry, dudes, you got to miss out on this one. But, uh, if, I think because, you know, there's so many reports of like, I guess, women being harassed at, um, convent, uh, at these kinds of events and like you're really close to other people that they do offer, um, a place for women to stand with, uh, other women, which I freaking love so much. So, uh, sorry guys, but yeah, for, for women, that's, that's a cool thing, I guess. Uh, manga cafes. Um, I have done manga cafes a few times. You've definitely seen them in anime where, um, like maybe the weird otaku dude is, is like I'm always going to the mon cafe using the computers um yeah these things they exist um really fun I've only been to them for a few times um so I can't I can't I, I can't really see too much about them but yeah they exist and they're fun and you can just uh pay a set price or a, a price is like you know maybe 800 yen an hour or something like that that's just me pulling that out of my butt I actually don't exactly remember how much these usually are but you can you have access to um uh like fountain drinks manga and then you can go back into your room you can use uh the computer some people will like sleep in these because sometimes it does end up being cheaper um if you buy like a night than staying at a hotel and then you just get to read manga all night usually only in Japanese but actually there is recently there have been um manga cafes and uh anime hotels and stuff that have started carrying English manga which I think is really cool so anime and manga museums, these are just a few of um, the anime and manga museums that exist in Japan that might be of interest to you. So the Tokyo Anime Center, this is in Shibuya. I haven't had a chance to go uh, here yet, but the Tokyo Anime Center, um, because I haven't gone, I can't 100% tell you what it's like, um, but it's just a general anime museum, but they always switch out like the main exhibit. Um, like last time I was in Shibuya, 
I, I think it was Dr. Stone was the last one that they did. I think they've done um, a JoJo one before. So I'm kind of waiting to see um, when if they put one in. I think they're, they're, they've done Kimetsu no Yaiba recently too. I'm waiting for them to put one in um, that I really want to go to. Um, so yeah, the Tokyo Anime Center in Shibuya. I can't really say too much about that. But you can look on their website if you just type in Tokyo Anime Center Shibuya in Google. Um, they do have a website. And so they'll tell you um, what collaborations and exhibits they're doing. Um, Kyoto International Manga Museum. Also, not didn't really get a chance to go here. Um, I really do want to go here. Kyoto is just really crowded, so I try to avoid Kyoto. But there is a manga museum in Kyoto. Um, so I did go to the Osama Tezuka Museum in Kobe. This was such a an absolute treat. Um, now I really like um, Osama Tezuka. I'm a really big. I, I'm a really big fan of um, his work. Astro Boy. I just love so much. I love his style. Um, I want to read so many more um, of his of his works. Um, so I, I would say that I'm honestly like a casual fan as far as Tezuka stuff is concerned. But I had the time of my life. Like one of my favorite things I've ever done in Japan was go to the Osama Tezuka um, Museum. So if, even if you're just so slightly into his works. Um, definitely go there. Um, it's in Kobe. If you decide, to, uh, Kobe is near Osaka. So if you decide to fly into, uh, Osaka, you can get to Kobe in like an hour from, uh, Osaka. Definitely worth it. It's, um, the museum is actually in a town where, uh, Osamu Tezuka grew up. Um, and it's, it's this like little small town of like the cutest town I've ever seen in my life. Like I totally want to live there. And just a little small quiet museum it's got three floors it's not that big but um if you go through everything and like read every um just like wall of text they have in the museum I, I mean I stayed there for like two and a half hours <laughs> but I read and did every little thing that I could do in the museum uh absolutely recommend it uh, the Studio Ghibli Museum, or Ghibli, Ghibli, I will not pretend to know what we're supposed to freaking say um in Tokyo I've never been he here either, but um, I've heard really good things. It's on the west side of Tokyo, so it's more on the, like, uh, countryside of Tokyo. Yes, Tokyo does have a countryside in a way. It's in the west part of Tokyo. Tokyo Prefecture is very long. So it has a, a, a lot of area to the west that's not as much of a city as regular Tokyo. Um, oh, gosh, we gotta wrap up. We gotta wrap up, boys. Um... Definitely recommend that if you're into um, Studio Ghibli stuff, Studio Ghibli stuff. Gundam base in Tokyo and Yokohama, so you can buy all your cool Gundam stuff. It's also like where the giant, you've probably seen pictures of like the giant Gundam. There's one in Tokyo, now a new one in Yokohama. Uh, I recommend it too. Uh, not Even though like I'm not a, a Gundam person, it's just so, like going into Gundam base was is so cool. Um, so, and then there's a Naruto and Borto park, um, in Hyogo. Hyogo is where Masashi Kishimoto grew up, and so, yeah, Naruto and Borto park, um, as well as there's many pop-up museums that will happen. Um, so this picture of me down here with the Yuri on Ice boys, this was a pop-up museum that went on for maybe about a month, uh, in Sendai. And yeah, you just go through and it'll have, like, original artwork from the, the animators and history about the show and stuff. Um, these will pop up all over Japan. So you can actually go to that Collab Cafe website or just type in Collab Cafe JP, um, into Google and they will also list pop-up anime museums that you can go to all around Japan. Um, those are always really fun. So yeah, anime and manga collab cafes, I really gotta get going, but these are so, also very fun to go to. Um, I mentioned before that you can go to anime and manga collab cafes and the food's not so great. It's really not, like I went to the Code Geass Cafe, which is um, what, the, what this picture's from, and it was like the worst chocolate cake I've ever eaten in my freaking life. But it was really fun because uh, if you order a drink and a, um, and a food at the cafe you'll usually get like um for example that thing with suzaku on it like the little picture you get like a postcard and then when you order a drink you usually get a um what are these called i always forget a coaster you'll get a coaster um so that's all you'll get like a random character coaster which is always really fun it's kind of like pulling in genshin impact it's like what character am i gonna get can i pull the lelouch no it's the nautily and that is half the fun right it's like a gimmick um and then the the nakayoshi one um this is at tokyo sky tree i always uh i recommend looking up tokyo sky tree tokyo village um collab cafe uh in japan uh they always are doing some kind of anime collaboration cafe so this was nakayoshi which is uh the the company responsible for, for publishing the manga for like Tokyo Mew Mew, Peach Peach Peach, Shugukara, and Saint Hill. So that was a fun little cafe. 
And, and, and like, you know, you never would have thought, like, they, Japan just doesn't just do what's new and, and popular all the time. They'll always go back and do, you know, anniversary cafes. Like, who, I never thought it would go to, like, a Peach 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 or Mermaid Melody cafe. Like, that's crazy. Um, video game shops and cafes. You got the Square Enix Cafe in Akihabara. It did not close down. There were articles saying that it was closed down in Akihabara. That's not true. Um, it just moved. And it moved to what I think is a way better location. But yeah, you have the Square Enix Cafe and they and go to their website because they always switch out the, um, the main theme of the cafe. Um, last time I walked by, they were doing Chrono Cross because Chrono Cross just came out. Or Chrono Cross, the, the um, remaster just came out on Switch. So they were doing a Chrono Cross thing. Um, next they're doing like the whatever anniversary of Final Fantasy 7. Sometimes they do Final Fantasy 14. They often do Dragon Quest. Um, uh, they'll, they'll do Nier series. They'll do Kingdom Hearts. They always switch it out. So you can always look on the website for that. Um, there's a Dragon Quest Lawson's in Akihabara and Dendon Town. I have not been there in like a year or so. I hope it's still around. But yeah, Dragon Quest is so big in Japan. We, I know it's not as big in the West as it is in Japan, but they really respect Dragon Quest uh, in Japan. So you can do those. Um... Pokemon centers, they're all over Japan. There's like four in Tokyo. I think there's two in Osaka, and, or maybe just one in Kyoto and one in Osaka. So Pokemon centers, you gotta go. Uh, the Nintendo, there is isn't an official Nintendo store that just ha opened up like a year and a half ago, in, or maybe about two years ago now, in Shibuya, Tokyo. There's gonna be a Nintendo store also opening in um, Osaka as well, if you decide to go to Osaka instead of Tokyo. And then Super Nintendo World um, in Osaka. Um, at Universal Studios. Universal Studios, to me, is only worth it to go to Super Nintendo World. It's like 8,000 yen for a ticket, like $8 for a ticket, but you could do a Super Nintendo World. So if you're like not really into anime as much as you are Japanese video games, girl, there's tons of stuff for you to do too. No worries. And there's like, as I said, ton tons of video game uh, uh, pop-up shops and collabs and all this stuff. So, um, And they'll do stuff you'll never think about. Like, um, I had a fr I have a friend who's really into, um, the Mother series or Earthbound, and there was a pop-up shop in Tokyo for a while that was, like, Earthbound. Like, you'll never get that stuff in America, ever. Anime movie screening. So I mentioned this a little bit, um, at the beginning. So obviously just about every single anime movie gets screened in theaters in Japan. Um, recently, like, I went to go see, well, I wouldn't say recently, but, um, like, well, the quintessential, quint quintessential quintuplets movie is currently airing in Japan right now. I don't think that's getting a U.S. screening. Um, I've seen the Nononbiori movie here. I've seen the Given anime movie here. Uh, the Sound Euphonium movie as well. And these, I think, are all movies that did not get releases in the United States. So it's really fun to just see anime that you never would get in the West on the big screen in Japan. And you usually do get an exclusive event for attending the movie. For example, for the No No Biori one, um, I got like a coaster for, um, like I got like exclusive little printed artwork for the Sound Euphonium one. So that's always really fun. I don't know if they do that um in america all the time i don't remember i went to go see full mouse answer around in america i don't remember if i got anything for that but you usually like nine times out of ten will get an exclusive gift for attending the movie which is really cool and inside of the movie theaters um this is something that i don't know i never look i grew up in a small town in america so i maybe my small town just didn't have it but there are often gift shops in uh japanese movie theaters that will sell stuff that is from the movies that are currently screening and so you can get anime merchandise um that way as well so yeah just some of the the, the movies that i personally went to go see um in japan that i don't think got a u.s screening probably love live and pokemon and i know bell did bell definitely did um but at the time it took a while it took a while because bell aired in japan way early okay there's just collabs everywhere Everywhere you go, there's anime collabs. Um, this is at Tokyo Skytree. <laughs> um, they had an Evangelion um, collab there. I think right now it's JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. So at Tokyo Skytree, they're always switching out um, the collab that takes over the entire, I'm not kidding, the entire Skytree uh, becomes anime town. <laughs> um, that's me in front of the, uh, Naruto park bus. Um, yeah, from Osaka, you can actually take the Naruto bus to the Naruto park and all of your... 2007 Naruto dreams can come true. Um, they, they, this is like Genshin Impact stuff at, at Sweets Paradise, which is a um, cake buffet <laughs> in Japan. Um, the manhole cover, this is, um, you know, uh, you got the Hidagi twins on the uh, manhole cover. 
in uh, Saitama, where Lucky Star takes place, just anime stuff all around. Um, convenience stores are also a perfect place uh, for anime collaborations. Uh, for example, this is a whole live uh, collaboration where um, I got some Corone candy, um, and then like two, if you got like the whole life candy and then two haichu things um you could get a free clear file or a free little poster um so yeah yeah and they'll switch out the collabs of like different anime all the time so definitely where just go to your local convenience store like well, like eight minutes down the road you know this is where i got i got my whole life stuff um i won't go too far into this because i don't have a lot of time and um I've already talked a lot about anime IRL settings, and you can go to my uh, YouTube channel, Gender Garden, on YouTube if you want to watch these. But um, these these are towns in Japan that have settings that are in anime, um, and you can go there, and they often have like anime merchandise, and they'll have like stands of like the characters there too so i don't know take a screenshot if you're interested in any of these things again you can go to my youtube channel if you want more information on anime tourism in japan um and then i want to ask if there's any questions except for the fact that this is pre-recorded so um i think usually there's an interview after each panel so if you have any questions start typing them now um i'd love to answer any questions that uh you may have uh, anyways, thank you so much again. My name is Kira. My Twitter, if you're interested in following me for whatever reason, <laughs> Kira Hedgehog on Twitter, two eyes, K I I R A. Insta, Kira Fox, and YouTube. My YouTube is Ginger Garden. Um, if you have any questions about otaku life in Japan, I have no shame. I love uh, being in Japan. Um, and doing a bunch of otaku stuff here. So I hope that if you get the chance to come to Japan, you also get the chance to do that too. So, all right. Thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful rest of the OnCon. Big shout out to Brent and uh, everyone that just is in the chat and that does all the other panelists and stuff. Like God, this time we have some co amazing panelists, like amazing freaking panelists. That's so cool. Um, yeah, just you're welcome to tweet me if you have any questions or talk to me in the chat or whatever. Thank you so much, and hopefully I'll see you for the next OnCon. Bye! There we go! Um, actually, we're going to switch over that way. There we go! Um, thank you so much for the panel! That was awesome! Thank you! Thank you so much! <laughs> yeah, absolutely! And thank you for being part of OnCon. I know it's it's uh, the hours for you are a little different than it is for us, so appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> it's 6.57 a.m. at the moment. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Absolutely nuts. It's fun, though. <laughs> cool. Um, so, yeah, it's um, um, really appreciate, obviously, all of your um, your insights on um, doing stuff as an otaku in Japan. Um, uh, and I know you had a lot to get through there. Was there anything else that you, like, wish you had time to, to talk about in, in the panel and didn't have time for? Oh, goodness. Um... You know, for, for for that panel, I could always go into detail about like just how cool anime tourism is. Mm, yeah. Um, but you know, I I have a whole other panel put to decide <laughs> just for that part. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's always like more to talk about, like mm. how there's a there's like a manga hotel now in Whoa. Tokyo, like a manga and anime art hotel where you like can stay. It's kind of like the ca uh, manga cafes, mm. but you. You like stay in an actual like regular hotel like it's meant for actually staying. Okay, right? yeah. <laughs> and the, and there's just stuff that's popping up all the time, um, even though tourism is closed right now. Sure. Um, I just can't wait for tourism to open and just just to see what other kinds of awesome things are gonna pop up. Yeah. For fans. So, so there's a lot. I have to ask. So the manga hotel is it like like is each room like does each room have manga in it? Uh, so I've never been there, okay. but from my understanding of it's, uh, I can't, it's, I think it's called the Manga Art Hotel Tokyo. Okay. And I think it's just like everyone has, you know, you have your individual room, but then maybe like the, the, the downstairs area, there's like another room that's just like full of manga. Oh, okay. And they, they have, the cool thing about it is that they have English manga as well. Oh. There, which is, you know, hard to find in Japan mm. for obvious reasons. Um, and if you do find it, it's very expensive because mm. it's an import, you know? Yeah. Um, 
but yeah i i do that's a plan that's one of my plans though is to stay at that hotel i think there's already videos on youtube of it if anyone's mm -hmm. interested but I've never cool. stayed there myself interesting yeah. um is there anything um um what do you see as the big trends in anime tourism like do you see mm -hmm. that like expanding do you see um that changing significantly well i think it's just i think it's you know uh it's it's becoming bigger i mm -hmm. think it's beginning mm -hmm. to become more popular sorry it's like 7 a.m so my train of thought is yeah like you're fine there. you're fine <laughs> but yeah i think it's going to only increase i mean and you mm -hmm. continuously see anime coming out mm -hmm. that is basically being made to advertise a prefecture you know you mm -hmm. see it in zombieland saga you see it in let's make a mug cup mm -hmm. um you see it in love live too like you know the original love live took place in tokyo mm -hmm. and there's you know it's to but it's then okay. like yeah every for love life every next continuation or next installment of the franchise has mm -hmm. been like okay this is going to take place in a small town she's woke mm -hmm. and the next one's going to actually take place in odaiba to get people mm -hmm. to come into odaiba and stuff like that so i think when you see the when you see anime kind of prioritizing its setting and making mm -hmm. its setting a really big deal mm -hmm. i think that only can mean a good thing yeah. for anime tourism you know totally agreed um i know we talked about this um last time but i'm i'm curious is there um like is there anything that you think that uh could be done in those locations to kind of ramp up the tourism um then in some places kind of kind of like there's a standee in the, uh, the 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 bus station. That's more or less it. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, it's not very worth going to. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that the cafes just do so well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the Love Life Town, uh, new, uh, Love Life Sunshine Town, mm -hmm. uh, Numazu, which is in Shizuoka Prefecture. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as you walk out the station, they have the Love Life Club Cafe there, mm -hmm. and. Like, uh, that's a huge draw for people. And it, because it's so close to the station, even if someone's just passing through and they're a fan of Love Live, they can just get off the train and go to that. Oh, good and so, point. You, know, you know, I've been to towns that don't really embrace it that much. Um, but it's like, uh, some towns don't need to. Oh, because Bunny Girl Senpai, I think I talked about this last time, but Bunny yeah. Girl Senpai takes place in um, Kanagawa, like Fujisawa, Inoshima area. Yeah. And that's already a very popular, famous place. Yeah do visit in japan so it doesn't really need that whereas like other places like girls and ponzer takes place in oadai ibaraki no one would go there <laughs> if it wasn't for girls and ponzer but the girls and ponzer town has a girls and ponzer cafe too mm. which is a big part of why people like to go there but i think between that and having exclusive merchandise mm. in these places mm -hmm. um like i have a, a girls and ponzer acrylic stand of miho uh, where she's like wearing a train conductor outfit oh. from like that specific Oodai train station. Like yeah. you can get Oodai train station stuff mixed with Girls of Ponzer. It's the only place mm. you can get that kind of stuff. Yep. So I think like if, people, if, if, if towns do want to embrace mm. anime tourism, I think the cafes and the exclusive merch mixed in with their town yeah. are, the, are the two biggest things. Totally. Um, so a couple questions from chat. Um, as a non-Japanese speaking person, how hard would it, be, would it be to do otaku stuff using just Google Translate app on the phone? Uh, I, honestly, I think it's really easy because mm. um, my Japanese is not great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 Jap I I'm a Japanese language proficiency test level number four, okay. which is only like lower intermediate. Mm. So you know I struggle all the time, and I use Google um, I use Google all the time. I, I use Google Maps in English, but. Mm. Um, you know, I use Google Translate all the time when needed, and I've never really ran into anything um, that bad. If anyone ever has any questions or like translation issues that they can't work out, just like hey, tweet me at Kira Hedgehog. <laughs> I'll help you out. Um, but you know, technology is so awesome. Like you can go on these websites, these tourism websites that are only in Japanese, and just like translate them mm -hmm. uh, instantly with Google Translate. So I don't think you have to worry um, too much at all. Yeah. And and people know that foreigners are really into anime and True. i think especially when tourism opens up again hopefully there you know there's gonna be maybe more english signage more english websites and stuff like that so i don't think you have to worry too much at all and i know when i was there um you know it a store is a store 
you know, you go, you gather your things, you go to the front and you pay for them. Like they know, they know how to operate that. You know, you know, to, you know, bathrooms are the same the world over. So, right. you know, all those right. basic things kind of work the same way. Um, yeah. uh, also in chat, um, how much on average would someone expect to spend on a normal trip to Japan? So I guess, you know, mm. setting aside buying all the merch. Right. Oof. So this is always hard for me to answer because yeah. My first time in Japan was actually a college trip. Mm. This was back in 2014. Mm. Um, and so my, our school paid for a lot of it because it was mm. like an educational trip. And um, so I don't remember exactly how much I paid for that one. And then the second time I went to Japan, I moved there. So completely mm. different. Yeah. <laughs> right? But I mean, this, it's, such a weird, it's such a crazy question because obviously it's going to depend on what you're going to do. Sure. Um, flights can, I've seen, I have bought a flight as cheap as $800, hmm. but then, you know, lately they've been around $1,800. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you've got to account for that. It depends on the season. Now, the, surprisingly, the hotel might be one of your cheapest things. Hmm. Um, now I stay in capsule hotels a lot, which you can find for like 20 bucks a night, US dollars. Wow. But even regular Japanese business hotels, you can get for like 50 bucks a night. Wow. So, um, I think honestly you're going to want to buy a lot of merch in japan and spend a lot of money on food that's what i would budget mm -hmm. for mostly <laughs> even more so than hotel because i feel like some people spend more money on that than they do hotels <laughs> mm -hmm. so if i were to but if i were to have to give you a number um mm -hmm. for flight hotel i I think that if you're going to take the time to go to Japan and you're already going to be spending a thousand dollars on it on a flight anyway, mm -hmm. I would just go ahead and like you know go big or go home. I would save upwards to like around three thousand um, dollars U.S. dollars to come to Japan because if you're going to be here, you really want to experience everything. You don't want to get to Japan and be broke. Yeah, then that's no fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of like going to a con broke. That's no fun. <laughs> so you may as well save the extra money um, and wait until you have that extra pocket change uh, to spend money on anime stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> totally, totally. Food. Um, let's talk food. So yeah. I, I know f um, one of the interesting things about Japan is that they're like, there are so many cafes, there's so many little places to get food. Um, uh, and there are so many options that way. Do you suggest mm -hmm. folks kind of focus on the idea of, okay, I'm going to, um, I know I'm going to go for lunch here and then dinner here and that kind of thing, or yeah. to just be more flexible and say, I'm gonna you know, grab some food here, grab a snack here. I'm not gonna like say, okay, at noon, I'm gonna do this thing. Um, yeah, what's that like? Um, I would have, I, I personally think the best option is to not have a plan mm. because Sometimes you'll find your favorite place to eat um, by just walking around, wandering around, and be like. Uh, the great thing about Japan is a lot of the restaurants. You probably know this. Mm. They will. They do. They they make like wax figures of the food. Yeah. Um, that, I've never seen this in the United <laughs> States, but yeah, they make. Uh, it looks like you could eat it. Mm -hmm. They look so real, and so it gives you a really good idea of what food they serve, what the portion size looks like as well. And so I just kind of recommend. Um, you know, don't don't be too picky. Um, cause every time I try to schedule out, this is the restaurant I'm gonna eat at. It never works out. I always eat somewhere else. Okay, yeah. Every time. So um, because I just find something else, I'll just come across something else. So uh, just you know, don't worry too much about food. You're gonna be if you're gonna be in Tokyo or Osaka, you're in a you're in a city of 10 million people. There, there's food to be had <laughs> all around. So um, I would just say like even if if you go in any major station. Mm usually has a restaurant floor. Oh, okay. So if you're nearby station, go to that restaurant floor that you'll find all sorts of, you know, Japanese or other Asian foods too. So I wouldn't worry too much. Mm -hmm. uh, just walk around, you'll find something. Cool, cool. Any tips for um, ordering food in a, in a restaurant? You know, walking yeah. in being like, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, it can be a little bit difficult when you go in, and especially if you go to like an izakaya, mm -hmm. which is um, you know famously known for uh, you know very you know, traditional Japanese food, sake. A lot of people go there after work. You know the, mm -hmm. the Japanese businessman smoking in the izakaya, <laughs> that kind of vibe. Because uh, a lot of those menus, they're it's like 
very stylistic kanji characters. Oh. Like I can't read. Like some Japanese people can't read. I've I've okay. been to Izakaya with Japanese people and they don't know what they're reading. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck to um, any of us. Yeah. Anyway. But um, you know, uh, pointing and saying like "kore kore" is this in mm-hmm. Japanese. So you can just point. You know, like you know, when I didn't know any Japanese, I was just pointing at stuff and saying "kore." which is like just this please mm-hmm. and it's fine it's fine they know you're a foreigner they know that maybe your, your japanese is not so good um if you don't look asian yeah so yeah. yeah i wouldn't worry too much about it um especially in really touristy places they'll have english menus oh, you don't okay. worry actually in fact lately um a lot of ordering has been done through a touch screen and you almost you'll never talk to a waitress okay um, and a lot of them will have English options as well. I've never, ha- I've never been to a place that had the tablet for ordering that didn't have an English option. Gotcha. So you might be able to eat at a lot of places without even oh. you know, talking to people nice. <laughs> these days. Yeah. I remember seeing an episode nice. of Japanology where they, they talked about that. The, the one of the one of the selling points of transitioning to the tablets is yeah. you can serve you know folks in who speak English or French or whatever, like, like you know, yeah. all of that is kind of yeah. handled all for you on that. Yeah. Right. That totally right. makes sense. Um, it's important for food allergies and stuff too. Yeah. Like you don't know what's in stuff. And that's, that's a good right. question too, actually. Like, so, um, as, somebody, as John's saying in the chat, if you are, you know, diabetic or you have an allergy, some, some, mm. something like that, um, how is that kind of negotiated? Um, that's a great question, actually. And this is one that's important to me because um, my sister is actually like, deathly allergic to a lot of things. <laughs> Bit, we've been in ambulances and hospitals oh. and whole thing, So it's like pretty like intense. And so like, you know, the last thing you want is to be stuck in a foreign country um, and, and have a situation like that. And so um, I've kind of learned how to be like, you know, my sister has allergies um, to this, this, and this. And, um, yeah, and I actually have a Japanese friend who's allergic to um, olive oil. And so oh. she has to, uh, when she goes into restaurants, obviously she's Japanese, so it's, she can communicate better, but she asks them, like, does this have olive oil in it? And, you know, they'll go back in the kitchen and ask and be very thorough about allergies and stuff like that. Um, so I've never really ran into any issues uh, myself with it. Um, usually what I would recommend is that if, take a list of the food you're allergic to if you don't know a japanese speaker um just google translate it. it it'll you could probably um even just with google translate it'll probably be right you'll get the point across Close enough, yeah. and, and bring it in japanese and to a restaurant if you have fears that there's something you're allergic to in a food um show it to the waitress and i think you'll be okay gotcha cool um how about just sort of um so I know over here in America that you know often you'll go to places that you're saying in the chat you know keto friendly or yeah. you know um, mm. grain free or whatever and like yeah. it's, it's it's very easy to find those places because they're advertised so much. Is yeah. that as true in Japan? Oh man, I would say no, almost not at all. Oh, um, interesting. So like being uh, being a vegan and doing um, kind of like organic mm. foods or uh, keto friendly and stuff is is. It's still very new. It's still very fresh in Japan. In fact, um, recently I have been able to find like organic foods in grocery stores, but that is not always the case. You usually have to go to a special grocery store for that. Um, but as far as like vegan places, really only in Tokyo and, and like in the very, in the more like bougie kind of Western areas of Tokyo, like Akihabara, you're not going to find vegan food half the time. But in, um, and like Amoto uh, Sando, which is like near Harajuku, mm. in kind of more, I'd say upscale places that have a lot of foreigners, mm. you will find vegan restaurants. They do exist, mm-hmm. um, but outside of Tokyo, mm. I don't, I don't really see it that much. So if if you're vegan or have uh, certain dietary needs like that, you you do have to be a little bit more careful. It can it can get a little tough. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um... Do you have any tips for sort of general, like on the street navigation? I know for me, when I when I would come out of the, the train station, I'd be like, I think this is Shibuya, you, you know, yeah. uh, and you, you see some, some landmarks and so forth, but then you'd, you'd go three streets over and I'm like, am I still where I think I am? Is this the neighborhood? Yeah. Um, gosh, I'm right there with you <laughs> <laughs> um, on that. Cause uh, you know, uh, Shibuya station, Ikebukuro station, these huge stations, they have like, 
50 exits. It's true. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I, uh, first time I was in Shibuya, I just wanted to go to Shibuya Crossing mm-hmm. and see the one. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, yeah. that's how I knew it was Shibuya. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like, I come out of like some completely different exit and I'm walking for like half an hour just to find <laughs> <laughs> what I thought was Shibuya. Yeah. But you know, uh, use Google Maps can be your best friend and your worst enemy. It can say it can really mess you up, but I'd say eight out of ten times it's gonna be your best friend because um, if you use it, um, if you get off of a train line mm. and you have something in Google Maps that's like I want to go to Shib- uh, Shibuya 109, mm. it'll tell you what exit you need. Like oh you need the Hachiko exit or exit number eight mm-hmm. or whatever. So follow that. That's generally pretty good. Um, I used to forget, I used to not notice that Google Maps told you what exit to take. Uh, and you know, my, you know, country bumpkin butt would just kind of like, look at, I'd be like, oh, that's an exit. Let me go out that way. <laughs> Thinking, oh, that, this train station only has two exits, right? No, <laughs> you will get yourself lost. So my biggest tip for that, mm. as far as like getting out of train stations and navigating is look at the, at which exit you're supposed to get out of. Cause gotcha. taking exit six, an exit seven, two, you'll be on two completely different sides of town. Wow. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so be careful of that, I would say. Gotcha. Cool. Um, uh, yeah, no, that, that, that totally makes sense. Um, question around like fandom in general. One of the things I've always um, wondered is, um, like, I, one of the problems with being a fan over here is like, if you're a fan of Love, Life, Sunshine, there yeah. aren't a lot of like, official Love, Life, Sunshine events. Um, yeah. How do fans in Japan know, you know, I'm a fan of Genshin Impact, oh, there's a collab happening, there's this happening, there's that mm-hmm. happening. Like, it, how do people, like, find those things, and how is that stuff, mm-hmm. like, communicated out? Uh, yeah, it used to be really hard for me to find out those things, yeah. like, collaboration cafes. I usually just had to get really lucky if I saw something on Twitter mm-hmm. or, um, like, uh, even Reddit or something like that. But uh, I've been using this, I sent the link earlier in the mm-hmm. chat, um, collabcafe.com. And that's what yeah. Japanese people use too, to see like, oh, there's gonna be a spy family cafe mm-hmm. soon. Um, but mostly I've just, before I found that website, I just kind of had to keep my eyes peeled on Twitter. I recommend following uh, certain Japanese accounts, like uh, people might be familiar with Animate, uh, oh, yeah. a really popular store in Japan. So they, there's like an Animate cafe, mm-hmm. um, follow that. Um, follow that. Uh, you can also just do like hashtag korabo. You'll have to oh, okay. do the Japanese like korabo in the here in katakana letters. Mm. But usually with that hashtag on Twitter, you can scroll through and see who's advertising for a cafe. But really, that's the only way I've been able to find. So sometimes huh. I'll completely miss a cafe because I just don't uh, know what's going on. But you just kind of got to look at like um, for the Kaguya Sama Love is War Cafe. Did not know that was going on. Until I was walking around in Akihabara and I saw a sign for it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, you, you know, you might have to just do that too. Interesting. Um, yeah. And I know in some cases for some of those, like, they are so limited. Um, I, I've heard stories that some of the are so limited that they're like, that they deliberately, like, don't advertise too much. Because they're like, we're going to be here for, like, three days. We're, we know we're going to get our, the activity, so we're fine. So it's like, I, I, I wish I would have known. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's always the worst because yeah. Japan. That's the thing about Japan: limited stuff, mm-hmm. and I, it sucks because um, you know, if I do a video of a collaboration cafe, um, like for example, there was a fruits basket one in Harajuku yeah. a couple years ago, and so I still get comments on that video. That's like, oh, I'm gonna go to this cafe. I'm like, yeah, you're at two years too late. Mm-hmm. It's only open for like a month, you know. So uh, that's the other, you know, kind of crappy thing about it is nothing's permanent. There are permanent anime cafes, but it's like one piece, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so JJ in the chat is asking, um, I said a friend of mine was um, uh, in Tokyo years ago, and the locals showed them around and steered them sort of towards in a way certain um, izakayas because some of them are more or less mm-hmm. kind of able to handle foreigners and have people yeah. around there. Is that still the same, or is that kind of hit or miss? Like, is, do, you, do you see that happening significantly? Um, oh man, I can't tell because in my experience, mm. the izakayas I've been to, I've been to with Japanese people. Ah, uh, gotcha, yeah. Um, which, which helps a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, there, there are definitely cases, especially in places like Kyoto, mm. 
mm. which is very touristy. And they have, but they have a lot of um, like streets that are just all izakayas, but they're like local places where people yeah. like live at the izakayas, like their houses are attached to the restaurant. Um, and you don't really see a lot of foreigners going in there, but you know, those places, they, they, they'll, they've served the same locals for like, uh, probably decades. Yeah. So I don't even think Japanese tourists go into some of those. <laughs> it's like for the local locals. Mm-hmm. And they, they, you know, they know each other. Yeah. So, you know, I've never had an issue quite like that before, but I mean, yeah, I'm sure it does happen. Sure. So. Um, well, and I think it's one of those things where, you know, um, if it happens at one Isakaya, don't worry, there are 10 other on the same street. <laughs> You know, right. there, there are plenty of other options. Right. And you'll, you'll know they're friendly if they have English menus, because they wouldn't uh, expect foreigners if they, they didn't have. But, um, yeah, I've never had an issue at all with something like that. That's cool. Um, that, that, that totally makes sense. Um, let me pull up the chat here. Yeah. Actually, any cool stuff for Sonic fans to see in Japan? <laughs> uh, there's, to- uh, there's Tokyo Joyopolis, Sega mm-hmm. Joyopolis, which is like a big Sega arcade in Odaiba. And they have some Sonic stuff, probably. But cool. other than that, probably just the Sega arcades. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's it's. Um, when I heard the Sega arcades were rebranding, I was like, oh, like you, you know, yeah. it's, it's just one of those things where, like you say, they're still physically there, which is the name. Yeah, yeah, and that that really like and the inside is the same, and there's still the same games. Like, in fact, some of the change machines are the same because they still have Sonic characters on them. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, like so, they haven't completely like changed it, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, it's it's a little bit frustrating. It would be like if Nintendo changed their name, you know yeah. what I mean? Like there's something about Sega as a name that I in the Sega logo that is so nostalgic to me. I'm gonna yeah. miss seeing that on the buildings. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, and especially, you know. especially because like really Sega was the only like real video game like logo I saw in Akihabara basically yeah. right? in terms of like a, a yeah. big presence you don't see right. Sony or Xbox right. or Nintendo there yeah right um, the only other one you'll, you'll kind of see is Namco but that true. one's not at all as iconic as the Sega one you yeah know? absolutely so it's a little weird I don't like the Gigo logo it's way more boring I don't even know what Gigo means <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll see Hoyoverse soon um, I hope so everywhere I, I know so. totally um um, oh, uh, John had a good question because um, I actually had this um, happen to me. Um, um, how cash based mm. is uh, uh, Japanese society? And I guess generally like in stores and such. Uh, yeah, very cash based. I've never ran into a place that didn't take cash. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, uh, basically what I do. <laughs> Long story short, uh, my my American bank account decided, oh, you're not a you're not a resident of uh, oh. America. We're gonna shut your bank account down. Oh. Okay. So I'm actually in the process of getting a Japanese visa card right now to oh, okay. replace my American visa card. So I, yeah. I just have like no ties to American bank, which is fine. Yeah. But I the reason I say that is because um, what I was doing in Japan was whenever uh, we'd get paid or whatever, I would just take however much money out of my account in cash mm-hmm. and just use that for the month or however long I needed it for. Like I almost never, use, like I, don't, I didn't have a Japanese Visa debit card. Mm-hmm. I just used cash. Now yeah. I have a cash card, okay. that, but that is only to use at an ATM to get cash from your bank account. That's mm-hmm. not, you can't scan that at checkout. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that should tell you how much of a cash society Japan still is. And I, and I like that. Mm-hmm. I actually like that a lot of, um, about Japan. So yeah, just when you come uh, exchange it directly for cash, just take cash everywhere. Cause you don't yeah. want to get stuck in a situation where it's like cash only. Cause a lot of places are cash only. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I almost never use a card here. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that's, that's the way it was for me. And that's interesting it's still that way. Oh, um, well, except for, um, the, I, I will mention the IC cards, the, um, which are usually used for the trains. It's like a reliable uh, okay. card. Um, you know, you put, you know, put fifty bucks on it, five thousand yen on it. You can use it not only for the trains. You can use it for the buses. You can use it for food. I use it at McDonald's. Oh, wow. Uh, you can use it at drugstores. You can use it all over the place. So um, if you kind of are weird about touching money, or you don't want to hold all that cash with you at one time, um, yeah, put just put all your money on an IC card. Uh, and use it that way <laughs> if you want touchless pay. Good idea. Absolutely. That's yeah. great. Um, um, 
Are there any products from the USA you miss the most? Products from the USA I miss the most. Um, Are there any you uh, can't get? Toothpaste. Okay. Toothpaste, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, Japanese toothpaste. Um, so I implore you, in a way, to try. If, you go, if you're in Japan, Ooh. if you don't bring your own toothpaste, go buy some toothpaste, like just whatever toothpaste you buy. It's like not as good. Like the taste is not. It's not good. It's okay. not good. So whenever I'm in America, I bring over like cr- crest, like bake the, the, what is it? The baking soda kind mm. of flavor. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> it's, I haven't been in America in a long time, but mm. I usually, I, I'll like bring back crest toothpaste <laughs> back from America to Japan. Also, um, bring deodorant. <laughs> oh, you got, I don't know if you got, you've may have not heard this, but like Japan, the j- deodorant industry in Japan is like not as much of a thing like there's like oh. two brands of deodorant wow um and it's all the roll-on kind which i hate that kind mm. so like me and my husband we actually order like he'll order his um like old spice or whatever and i'll mm. order my dove or whatever from amazon <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> like the regular deodorant um yeah because they just don't have it in japan interesting so, huh. i wish i could get that here yeah that, that totally makes sense wow yeah i know those those are weird things but yeah. they're just they're different. Totally. They're yeah, very I different. Never would have thought. I'll, I'll definitely have to try Japanese toothpaste when I go over there. Yeah, you'll, it's now I'm curious. Maybe you'll pick out a. You'll get lucky and pick out a good one. But if you're like, you know, it's hard to find the good ones. <laughs> just try it. What is it about it? Is it like? Is it like not minty or is it like not 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 sweet? I feel it's like just... it's not minty. Like I feel like, um, like I've been using Japanese toothpaste a lot recently, mm-hmm. but. I, I buy like a real, I buy like a seven dollar tube. Okay. <laughs> like, what does crest cost in in like at most yeah, like three dollars? Four, but yeah. Like, uh-huh. Right, I buy like the seven or eight dollar one here now, um, but so maybe I, I I've gone through enough brands that I know what I like mm-hmm. if I have to buy Japanese a Japanese brand, but it's like. Uh, when I go back to America and use American toothpaste, I forget how like overpowering the mint is. <laughs> it's strong. Like, yeah. It's really strong. It's really strong. So um, I think you'll when you try Japanese toothpaste, you'll be like, "Where's that?" Oof? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, gotcha. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's the best way I can describe it. <laughs> Maybe there's just the, 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 uh, there's Japanese subtlety to, to their toothpaste, right? There's just lots of subtle flavors. Subtlety there. to the toothpaste. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, there really is. Hundred <laughs> percent. Cool. Well, um, I will let you go. Thank you so much for answering these questions and staying up to to help out with the thing. And and, and thank you so much for the panel. It was fantastic. Well, thank you for running on con all the time. It's fun. Bet, I do. <laughs> you yeah, no problem. Uh, cool. Uh, thank you so much. We're gonna take a quick break and be right back. Bye. <laughs>